first up, though, we're looking at one of the most contentious issues in global agriculture, genetically modified food. There's obviously a robust debate in Australia about the pros and cons of the GM crops that have already been introduced, such as cotton and canola. But what's next? Scientists here are busy assessing the potential and performance of a whole range of genetically engineered crops, from wheat and barley to bananas and sugarcane. And as Kerry State reports, despite the small size of the trial sites and the precautions being taken, these experiments are proving just as divisive. It looks like business as usual at this GM crop field trial site near Canberra. But one thing that has changed is the level of security. Right now we have a security guard in place uh, in, uh, at night um, and going forward what we're looking at is uh, everything from you know, obviously including uh, improved fencing and uh, potential electronic surveillance. This is why. In July, Greenpeace activists allegedly scaled the fences at the CSIRO's research facility and used brush cutters to destroy a GM wheat crop. Two Sydney women will face charges of trespass and damaging property. The cost of the damage that was done was in the order of $300,000. And that's been estimated on the basis of we will simply have to repeat the whole thing again next year. Greenpeace doesn't just want to postpone this work, it wants to stop it altogether. So there's no chance of the crop being released commercially. If we were to go down the path of commercialisation, um, there's the risk that GM bread could pose a risk to Australians' health, but also our biggest grain market. While the focus has been on this genetically modified wheat trial, it's certainly not the only experimental GM crop planted around Australia. In fact, this sort of fieldwork has been going on for around two decades on all sorts of crops, from lupins and field peas to papayas and pineapples. Right now, there are active GM trials in these locations. Greenpeace wants them all shut down. But it's the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator that decides where the field experiments go ahead. And so far, the answer has always been yes. We've uh, uh, given approval for about 90 um, what we call licences for dealings involving uh, release into the environment. And about 73 of those relate to field trials. So these are what we call limited and controlled releases. And the other licences that we've given relate to a full commercial release. We're fine with GM research in the lab, but Greenpeace believes that we just don't know enough when it comes to genome function to support release of a living genetically mo modified organism into the environment. Just having, having uh, experimentation at, at, at uh, lab level really doesn't have any practical outcome. I think there are going to need to be a lot of practical outcomes for... Uh, food security in the world in the not too distant future. James Dale runs a GM banana program at Queensland's University of Technology. And one obvious bonus of trialling these crops beyond a laboratory or glasshouse is they have room to mature. They may look like any other Cavendish banana, but this GM version contains higher levels of pro-vitamin A and has been designed to improve diets in Africa. And in East Africa, and particularly Uganda, uh, their staple food is bananas. They eat around about one kilo per person per day. The difficulty with that is the bananas they eat are relatively low in pro-vitamin A. And one of the ways to overcome these micronutrient deficiencies is to increase the levels in their staple food. Professor Dale has been experimenting with biotech bananas since the early 90s and says labelling GM crops Frankenstein food is more about fear than fact. Everybody harks back to those very early days of genetic modification you know, where people were, were looking at all sorts of things, as, as you said, putting in fish genes, etc. It's a bit like, it's 
a bit like the, the first version of the mobile phone. If any, if any of you can remember what the first version of the mobile phone was like, it really wasn't mobile. It was very heavy. It carted this thing around. OK, that was a long time ago, and we've now got fabulous smartphones and small and do, do all sorts of things. Um, genetic modification, amazingly, has come along that track as well. Uh, and more and more what we're seeing is people uh, and groups using plant genes, uh, modifying plant genes, uh, and modifying plants with plant genes. He says the foreign genetic material in this fruit comes from a banana grown in Papua New Guinea that naturally has high levels of provitamin A. We were targeting an increased level of provitamin A of about fourfold over wild type, fourfold over normal bananas. Well, we're up around 15 fold in some of our best lines, so much, much better than we'd hoped to. There's a lot of PR framing um, around these trials in relation to saving the hungry people of Uganda. And all of the research shows in relation to vitamin A deficiency that the best solution is a diverse, um, healthy diet. African farmers will have to wait at least another seven years for the pro-vitamin A packed bananas. In the meantime, Professor Dale says any accidental release from the trial site is unlikely. Because they're essentially sterile, we don't get transgene flow. So there's no pollen flow moving from our genetically modified bananas to, to non-genetically modified bananas. In fact, we could probably grow them a metre apart and the genes would never move from the modified plant to the non-modified plant. So from, from that perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's very safe. Another person responsible for keeping a field trial contained is Andrew Jacobs. He has the keys to an outdoor GM experiment in South Australia, a state where commercial genetically engineered crops are banned. While opponents have labelled field trial containment measures laughable, this scientist says the rules set by the regulator are among the most rigorous in the world. In this site, we have, uh, have to ensure that there have been no plantings of any related species, so any wheat or barley, um, in a 500 metre radius of this site. We monitor that site regularly. Um, we have to be very careful about entering and exiting the site in terms of making sure that there's no grain or other plant material that's removed from the site. One concern Greenpeace had in relation to the wheat risk assessment is the failure to consider the impact of extreme weather events. So wheat's been carried 2.75 kilometres on the wind. There is um, some pretty good research that so shows that wheat and barley pollen are viable for only about a couple of metres in, in the air before, before they're non-viable. This project near Adelaide is all about creating tougher wheat and barley. Crops that tolerate salt or drought better, or use nitrogen more efficiently. I think the technology has a lot to offer in terms of farmers' inputs into the land. Um, I certainly believe that um, it's just one technology that we need to have in our arsenal. And I think it will help, help us address some of those important environmental um, social issues that we're going to face moving forward. People keep asking the same question, but what about the promised benefits? Isn't it worth the risks? And we say, OK, what about the promised benefits? Show me the evidence of that beyond biotech PR claims. It's not there. Opponents say this sort of work won't fix social and environmental problems. It will cause them. You know, the calls to ban out field trials, I support that because we have to do other GM research before a field trial would be taking place because we get contamination of the system. Thanks for coming this afternoon to this paddock because we will look here at the indicators of fertility in the soil. Martin Stapper is one of the country's leaders in biological farming and an outspoken critic of GM. In fact, the former CSIRO employee claims he was dumped from the Peak Science Agency for publicly sharing his views. He says his objection to GM field trials is not sour grapes, but a cautious approach based on years of research. You can have everything under control with fences, with borderlines and with uh, buffer zones. 
but a human error is in a small corner. And like those human errors have been made in the GM breeding world. Like in the United States, in the rice, GM rice research, they suddenly had contaminated rice varieties in the United States and the farmers lost millions of dollars because it was contaminated. That case involved German conglomerate Bayer Crop Science. It denies it acted irresponsibly, but recently agreed to compensate farmers up to $750 million. Whether GM experiments in this country have strayed too far is open to interpretation. In a document released last year, Greenpeace said there had been 29 reports of GM contamination in Australia, half of which had happened during field trials. The regulator says while rules have been broken in the last decade, containment lines have not. There have been uh, around about uh, 80 uh, what we called uh, potential non-compliances uh, that we found mainly administrative or technical non-compliances where people perhaps haven't kept uh, appropriate records. But there have been no, uh, no instances that uh, I'm aware of in terms of uh, field trials leading to uh, contamination. But he can't say it will never happen. There's always a potential for movement of uh, genetically modified material and our risk assessments um, uh, acknowledge that. While that risk fuels Greenpeace's fight, it's what's happening in the lab that's at the centre of its campaign. There's a lot of evidence to show that the genetic engineering process itself leads to um, deletions and rearrangement of genes in the plant um, uh, and creates a great deal of unpredictability about how that organism will then uh, respond in, the, in its local ecosystem. We do know that when you put a transgene into a plant, it can become unstable, but that gen generally doesn't make the rest of the genome of the plant unstable. And so as a researcher, that's a frustrating event. But for the general public, I don't really believe that that's a, a great concern. Critics say it is, because it can mess with how the body works when consumed. If we enter a new gene, a foreign gene, like from a bacterium or a virus, in our, through our food in our body, then in our gut, that bacteria can combine with bacteria that are living in the gut. Supporters reject that and say we've been messing with the genetic makeup of our crops for years. Traditional breeding certainly does mix up the genome a lot in a way that's not very controlled. Um, and indeed, they're you know, if we look at the commercial varieties of wheat and barley today, they're out in the field. Many of them have got traits which have come through processes like mutagenesis, chemical mutagenesis, which aren't very natural. When it comes to assessing whether grain from a genetically engineered crop like this is safe to eat, the standard practice is to compare it with a similar conventional crop. And we try and determine whether there's a significant difference in the metabolite profile, its gene expression profile, uh, and so forth. And if there's not a significant difference, then um, at, 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 a, at a first stage, you would say it's going to be very much similar to the, to the normal wild-type plant. Um, I don't know if you can ever say it's going to be 100% safe. There are always risks with with technology and, and so I think you need to do the, the testing such as animal feeding trials or, or perhaps human, human feeding trials as well. However, in many cases, animal and human feeding studies are not required. There are standard techniques uh, for assessing those, uh, the, the toxicity of food, the toxicology of food, which don't necessarily involve uh, feeding studies. The CSIRO has tested out some of the GM wheat being trialled here on rats and pigs. The modified starch wheat is harder to digest and higher in dietary fibre, so the theory is it will improve bowel health. The longest animal study ran 11 weeks and researchers say there were no ill effects. They now have approval to test the wheat on humans. But critics say longer feeding studies are needed. We have to know that something can't be, create havoc in the, in the future and then we can release.
And that's a long-term study, and that's a multi-generational study, that we have to feed animals for five generations, like rats and mice, with GM crops, and then show that they're happy, healthy, and fertile. And then I don't have any problems with GM. But those studies have not been performed in the international world. When the biotech industry can turn around and say, oh, look, we've addressed that issue of genetic instability before releasing a genetically unstable organism into the field, then we'll chat. But at the moment, the evidence shows that they're just not there, but that their corporate interests encourage them to push it anyway. Morning. Hey, Gosh. Good. How are you, Pretty? I'm well. While Greenpeace finds the involvement of private companies in GM plant science unpalatable, big business isn't leaving a bitter taste here. These are the Brisbane laboratories of BSES, a research body funded by the local sugar industry. Green, no sign of damage. It spent a decade fine-tuning GM techniques, experimenting with drought-tolerant, nitrogen-efficient and higher sugar-producing plants in the lab and out in the field. But those trials have been shelved and it's now teamed up with one of the biggest global players in GM, American chemical company DuPont, to focus on a new trait. For the outsider, it looks like we've made a huge investment and then didn't get to the desired endpoint and, and just dumped all the work, and that's not the case. Uh, I would argue that most of our GM work in Australia in sugar can have been highly successful, and it's that particular reason that enable us now to go to a next step, and that's to say, can we put a useful trait into sugarcane and, and take it to a commercial application? That useful trait is two herbicide-tolerant genes that developers say will allow farmers to spray for grass and broadleaf weeds. Now they are getting a full dose of herbicide spray. Right. And the material coming from the labs, growing really nice, fast, growing, whereas the non-transgenic, you know, the material are dying. You can clearly see the difference now. The losses to weediness in, in cane can be quite significant. It can actually reduce the yields by up to 50%. While local scientists have the skills needed to insert GM material into sugar cane, DuPont owns the technology being inserted and it's also helping fund the project. We were very optimistic when we started. We thought we'd have uh, products by 2015. Looks like it's now 2017, 2018 before we'd be uh, ready to go commercial. But the initial field trials, and they are only initial, they look pretty good. They're very encouraging. You cannot do this work in isolation and that you uh, cannot afford to be in a gene discovery program and a GM program if you have a, a, a program of the size that we run. And so it's very important to find a commercial partner that already has some of the technology in hand. DuPont invests around $1.4 billion a year on research and development, and half is spent on biotechnology. This will start about 300 R&D projects. And at the end of that, we'll end up with three products. So the wastage rate on the way through is pretty high. But that's research and development. It's risky, but that's what you do if you're going to grow and, and, and develop. Estimates of the cost of developing a GM crop from start to finish range from 20 to more than $100 million. And that's prompted public science agencies and universities to also partner up with local and multinational companies, including Monsanto and DuPont. There's no one person has all the brains in the world anymore. And we love working with folks like CSIRO and UWA and uh, New South Wales and Sydney and um, ANU and uh, South Australia. We've worked with them all uh, and we'll work with them again. In order to get uh, new opportunities into Australia as quickly as possible, we need to share with the world their capabilities, their knowledge, their know-how, their IP. Look, knowledge sharing is great if it's transparent. Um, there's been no transparency about the knowledge sharing involved in these trials between um, Global Biotech and our public taxpayer-funded science agencies. Of the GM work 
you're doing, mm -hmm. how much is being paid for by private companies? Well, that's done in collaboration with private companies, which means that we put in some resources and they put in resources. How much? And at this stage, um, they put in more resources than we do. But we make sure in, in doing this that, uh, first of all, we have uh, retained rights for Australia so that we make sure that any uh, successful outcomes of this will be deployed in Australia early. The GM licence holders in this story did disclose details about their partnerships, including French company Limegrain helps fund the modified starch GM wheat the CSIRO is trialling near Canberra and part owns the technology. The Vitamin A Banana Project in Queensland is funded by the Gates Foundation. DuPont pays for half of the drought-tolerant research work being trialled in South Australia, while US company Arcadia Biosciences provides the gene technology for the experiments that are looking at nitrogen use. People might think that Greenpeace is being naive, uh, raising concerns about that, because isn't it pretty normal these days for research to be done in partnership with corporations? Our response to that is not when the corporations have a vested interest in commercialisation, because that raises questions about the objectivity of the research. This has to be transparent to the public, so the papers, and remember a lot of these research fellows, it's their raison d'etre for, for, for living, is to write papers, and we write papers too that are both positive and negative, because the negatives you learn from. Objective or biased, transparent or shrouded in secrecy. Mixing profits and patents into an area of plant science that already polarises is likely to muddy the waters for some time yet.